Hallelujah. What a beautiful July, late July morning uh, we have here. Uh, June. To be to, I'm sorry? June. June. <laughs> I just had one last year. I, I meant to say uh, July because that's the way it feels, doesn't it? What a what a warm day and a joy to be together. The Lord's provided a beautiful breeze for us as well. Some of you are in the shade. That's not going to mean much in a couple minutes. So I hope you stay <laughs> hope you stay comfortable and uh, welcome you so warmly here to our Savior Lutheran Church. Uh, last week we began our summer mode of include of, of worshiping outside as often as we can. And so, so far, so good. And uh, you've noticed as you pulled in or where you're sitting that that beautiful new stained glass window is in the process of getting, getting in place. Uh, what you see is two days worth of work of installation and uh, that I can't imagine that it won't be completed by next weekend. Again, it's a whole month ahead of time and uh, we're so excited about that. But you can see that emerging with our goal and our whole purpose in that being able to be a very clear witness to the community, facing out everyone who passes by our Savior, walking, strolling, skateboarding, walking the dog, jogging, driving, whatever, can look over and recognize the Lord blessing their lives and to feel that and to be drawn into a closer walk with Him. That's our prayer. So that's really exciting uh, for us. A couple logistic things. All three doors are uh, unlocked and open, so any need that you have to go into the building, facilities are there, uh, please feel free to do that. Everyone should have a, a bulletin in hand. Uh, if you don't, hold your hand up and Steve and Cindy will make sure that you do get one so that you could follow along. Offering box is also located, uh, I don't even know, yeah, over here if, if uh, you would like to visit that and over here thank you two offering boxes uh, for you we will have communion and uh, I'll let Pastor Caleb kind of remind you of that procedure if you are here for the first time or back for the first time what a joy uh, to see you and and be able to welcome you and and you'll again you'll understand that communion procedure when we get to it real simple real simple so what a glorious day uh, we have Last week, uh, Pastor Caleb and I uh, real excited this summer to be able to be digging deeply into the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible. And so last week, we made the point that if you want to destroy the Christian faith, you got you to gotta knock out Genesis. You got to take out Genesis. The example of this this week as we get into Genesis chapter 3, which describes for us the fall, original sin of Adam and Eve into sin, the example of that this week is that you can't understand why sin and suffering exists in the world. You can't understand why you even struggle with your own sin. You can't even understand why there is a need to do anything about it if you take out Genesis particularly Genesis 1 through 3. You cannot truly get to understand that we have a God of love, a God of beauty, a God of creativity, and a God of generosity. So I'd invite you to stand if you're comfortable. Uh, to do that, we begin our worship on a note of singing.
of the Holy Spirit. Amen. He may be seated. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, hear now these words of good news. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for you, and for his sake he forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and as your pastor, I declare to you the full and free forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia.
O oh God, you justify the ungodly and desire not the death of the sinner. Graciously assist us by your heavenly aid and evermore shield us with your protection, that no temptation may separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Our first reading this morning comes from the Old Testament book of Genesis, the third chapter. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made a covering for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I would hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And the man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. The Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. according to St. Matthew, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him away, him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All of this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We now confess our common Christian faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead. 
whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated, and at this time I'd like to invite Eric forward for our children's message, as well as any children who uh, feel comfortable and would like to come forward as well. Let's go. Here we go. I see a few. Everybody else, come on up. You want to sit on a chair right there? You can sit on a chair. Yeah. Hi, hey, Harper. All right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Good morning. Hey, raise your hand if you've ever been tempted. Huh? All right. Any of you guys know what that word tempted means? Harper, you know what tempted means? No. No. Ruthie, you know what tempted means? No. Yeah. Um, we've got one more coming. Do you know what tempted means? Hmm? Do you know what tempted means? No. Yeah. Tempted means that if I held this up right here, or if I sat it out on your kitchen counter, and I said, don't eat them, would that be hard to do? It would be hard not to eat them, not to sit and watch them, see who was gonna open them, see who might eat them. Yeah, how about, any moms and dads ever said, no snacking before dinner? Huh? No snacking before dinner, right? Because it can ruin your appetite. All right. Some of those kids out there, maybe some of the teenagers, anybody ever ruin their appetite because they snacked before dinner? Uh-huh. Yeah. Right? That's a temptation, right? We are tempted because of something like a good snack, like Oreo cookies or chocolate chip cookies, right? That'd be so hard not to be able to eat that and wait and wait and wait, right? That's what a temptation is, all right? Hard, hard time. We want to have it right now, or we want to eat those cookies even though we know it'll ruin our appetite. And you know who tempts us? Who is it that tempts us? Anybody know? The devil. Satan tempts us. Yeah, every day. You guys at your age, all the way up to our grandmas and grandpas. Hey, we get tempted every day with things that we think we want to do, but that God doesn't want us to do or things that are against the rules, right? And you guys, in your preschool or in your school, now that it's out, sometimes you guys have temptations too, right? Maybe temptations not to share or temptations not to listen. Yeah, that's hard. And in today's story, we learned about how Adam and Eve were tempted and they gave in. And that's why we have this thing called sin, right? We have sin in here. And that's why sometimes we give in to temptation, right? But in our other gospel lesson, we heard from Jesus when he was tempted. Does anybody know what Jesus did when he was tempted? He 
said Bible verses. Yeah, he told the devil Bible verses right to the devil's face. All right? And he did that so that we know that we can use the Bible and, his, and God's word to defeat the devil when we're tempted. Do you know that? He says, we can, we can do that. He says, stop, devil, go away. And the devil will go away. Yeah. Do you know that? That you could do that. Right? Can you guys shout with me? Ready? We're on three. We're going to say, stop, devil. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Stop, devil. And now we're going to say, go away. Go away. That's right. Simple as that. And believe that God's going to help you. Okay? And again, with that temptation. All right. After, after church, if you want to come see me, okay? See if I have a little snack for you, okay? All right. You can head back. set up over here again to help you uh, from having to stare directly into the sun this hour if it helps a little bit. Uh, please pray with me as we begin. May the words of my mouth, meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our strength, our rock, our living Redeemer, Jesus. Amen. You know, so the Bible is truly an amazing book, isn't it? And the reason that God gave us his word in the Bible is because he wants us to get to know exactly who he is and why it is that we so desperately need him. So the point we made last week as we looked at Genesis, began the first book of the Bible, is that Genesis is the foundation upon which everything else that follows is built. Exodus, all the way through the uh, kings and judges and psalms and the prophets into the New Testament, the Gospels, epistles, all the way to Revelation. And I know that I said a mouthful last week. If you were here, you'd probably agree with that. But there is a whole lot that I left out of Genesis 1 and 2. Like when God said... Let us make man in our image. Referring to the pluralness of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then, male and female, he made them. Two genders, creating the institution of holy marriage and setting up the human family that would bring him glory. But you know this made in the image of God thing, being made in the image of God means that you and I as human beings have qualities that we share with God. I mean, look, my, my dog, our dog, has a great disposition. She's so sweet, got a lot of sass, makes us laugh. But our dog does not have a personality. 
My black lab, Mika, has a great doggyality. <laughs> or poochiality, whatever you want to say. You and I are unique, every single one of us. You have a personality. You have spirituality. You have morality. You have a conscience. There never has been and there never will be in all of creation someone like you. You are not an accident. You are essential. Genesis 1 and 2. Then God said and went on with Adam and Eve to bless them. And he gave them, remember, every seed-bearing plant, every fruit tree. But there was, however, this one tree right in the middle of gar the garden that they were informed that they were not to eat of. And this would be the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because at the moment that they would eat of that tree, God said that they would die. So see how it is, God did not make us puppets. God did not make us uh, robots. Genesis affirms that God made us unique. He gave us the spirit. He gave us free will, making us human beings who by a pure faith and love in their hearts, Adam and Eve, for their creator, that they would naturally want to worship him, naturally obey him and follow him. And what God wanted for them, for Adam and Eve to know, and for you and me to know here this morning, is that to listen to the devil is always costly. I'm not a huge fan of snakes. Maybe some of you are. But I don't know, talking snake? I'm out of here. <laughs> not back then. There was no fear in the garden. There was no need for fear in the Garden of Eden. And Satan knew it. Eve said to the serpent, that they would die if they ate from this particular tree. And Satan said, did God really say that? You will certainly not die. So what we have to understand is right from the beginning there in Genesis 3, that Satan is a deceitful liar. That's who he is at his core from the very beginning. And Adam and Eve fell into the trap. Their self-centeredness. Their pride kind of taking over and thereby opening up the door to evil and opening up the door to Satan. See, when Adam and Eve chose to be their own God, when they decided to make their own rules, which is exactly what they did, which is why you and I can do the same thing, what happened at that moment, Adam and Eve forever lost that priceless freedom of the will in spiritual matters breaking that beautiful unity that they had with their creator father pass that on to their kids to their kids right on down to your parents and to you and me and to our kids that event being which then spilled over and created sickness and pain and natural disasters and disease and pandemic and brokenness and death that's where it all originated Genesis explains it. And Adam and Eve's first reaction to all that was to hide. To hide amongst some trees that were there in the garden. You know, around about the middle of the week, I started thinking a lot about this. I started writing some notes down, trying to figure out. And so I asked you, what are the ways that people try to hide from God today? Because they do. So do you and I. In fact, where do you go when you think you're by yourself and you're okay? Because no one knows. God does. <laughs> Reminded me, uh, you should see the look on some teenagers' faces in youth ministry when I've made the point in the past 
that God goes on all their dates with them. <laughs> in fact, that he loves to sit in the back seat of the car. <laughs> See, you may be able to hide from your parents. Hide something from your parents. You may be able to hide from your teacher, your pastor, your boss. You may be able to hide from your spouse. If you've ever been there before, or something's going on in your life, or maybe it is you know someone, you're thinking of someone right now. If you're trying to hide, where can you, watch this, where can you hide when you are always in the presence of God? You can't. And the truth of the matter is, this is actually good news. You don't want to be distant from God. You know, when there's danger going on in your life, where do you want God to be? With you. Next to you. In you. But when you and I want to sin against God, where do we want him? Out of the way. We can't have it both ways. And Adam and Eve learned that lesson. Uh, an extremely hard way. You see, it's a foundational truth in Genesis chapter 3 that you cannot hide from a God who loves you so much so as to send his only begotten son to the cross to die for your sins, and you don't want to hide from that. Something else we learn from Genesis chapter 3 is that disobedience and sin always carries along with it disappointments. Sin never truly satisfies. I mean, it's fun. Let's be honest. That's why all of us are so good at it. It's fun, but sin truly never satisfies. In fact, it builds on itself. Have you ever noticed this? That when you sin against God, something happens inside and you like do it again? Because it actually becomes easier. That's the devil. It's the devil making us weaker and weaker and weaker. Look, you cannot live without God and be happy and content in life. Because of who God is and the way he made you with a personality, a spirituality, morality, with a conscience. And what Adam and Eve found out is what you and I know as well, regret, regret never erases the penalty of sin either. Adam and Eve immediately felt regret in their disobedience. They experienced shame right away, which led to blame. In fact, Genesis 3 is where we get the, play, the, the, the uh, blame game from. That's where it comes from. Genesis 3 is where it comes from that you and I and, and people always want to play the victim. That comes from Genesis 3. But because Adam and Eve regretted, or because you regret of sin, that doesn't fix a thing. The truth is, when we sin against God, if you're a Christian, when we sin against God, you're never truly content because you're a human being and because you have the Holy Spirit working on you, your conscience and heart. In fact, a person who lives in sin and tells you that they have absolutely no regret about it, number one, they're lying. <laughs> and number two, they'll pay the consequence. Sin always leads to consequences. We learned that in Genesis 3. Maybe not right away. 
You know, Adam and Eve could never have conceived the fact that they would lose their innocence. For example, and have to wear clothes. By the way, this might sound weird. The reason you wore clothes today to come to church is because of Genesis 3. It's the only reason why we clothed up today. They never could have fathomed being thrown out of the garden that was designed to satisfy every desire of their hearts and what that would mean that now they would have to sweat through life, starve, try to provide for themselves without nothing, experience pain, get older, whatever, and eventually die. All because God said, don't, as Eric explained, but Adam and Eve went ahead anyway. You know, as a parent, aren't there some things you've said to your children, don't? Don't. And you had a good reason for saying don't, or your parents had a good reason for saying don't to you. Because you don't want them to hurt themselves. You say don't and you give your children boundaries because you love them. So you say don't. And you allow them to experience the consequences of that just like God. Because he loves us. See how it is in these first three chapters of the Bible, how it is God just about covers everything? Does he love us? Yes. Did his love for Adam and Eve stop? No. He wanted the best for them. And he wants the best for you and me as well. So they were cast out of the garden. Verse 23 of chapter 3. Why? So that they would not eat of another tree that was there in the garden, the tree of life, because if they did, they would then live forever on this earth. Could you imagine that? That is now broken and in pain and suffering because they would, Adam and Eve, and then passing it on to us completely now, able not able to keep from sinning. You and I have that problem. But God didn't want it to stay that way, did he? For us either. And so God provided a way that they and we could be brought back to him again and live forever, which was the initial intent, the original intent. God's law never changed. The consequences of sin do not change. So God's plan was to send someone else in our place to accomplish his will perfectly in our behalf. And that promise was first made in Genesis 3, 16. Handing out the devil's punishment, God said, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, referring to Mary, and between your offspring and hers, Jesus, and he will crush your head. That's how you kill a snake. It's the only way. Even though he will bruise your heel. And so I know you see it, that this is a reference to what would, all, would ultimately happen to the devil and to sin and death on the cross by way of a substitute savior. Adam and Eve tried to hide themselves sewing fig leaves together. Wonder how that worked. So God chose to cover them in animal skin. But think about this with me for a minute. The only way that you could get animal skin or God would be able to get animal skin 
would be to, to kill the animal. The point, watch this. The point, blood was shed to cover over Adam and Eve's sin and shame. And that pointed directly to Jesus. That pointed directly to the way that God the Father would take care of the problem of sin once and for all. His own son's blood paying our sin debt in full. Praise God. Thank you, God. See, how do you understand who God is? If you disregard Genesis, how much he loves you and what he has done to rescue you, to forgive you. How do you understand a God of grace who is waiting to take you and me home to heaven if you pick and choose what parts of Genesis you like or you want to believe? Because if you do not believe that God made you the way he said he did, then there is no reason to believe that there is a problem of sin. And if you do not believe that there is a problem with sin, then you do not understand and believe that sin leads to eternal death. And if you do not believe that sin leads to to eternal death, then you do not believe or cannot understand why it is or how it is that you need a Savior. And if you do not believe or do not understand that you need a Savior, then you have no need for Jesus. And that's what the book of Genesis is all about. God bless you and love you all the way to glory. Amen. At this time, if you feel comfortable, you're welcome to stand in reverence as we go to the Lord's throne of grace as Pastor Caleb leads us there. As we join our hearts and minds together in prayer, we pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and all people according to their needs. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise as we, as we sit in the beauty of your creation and all the gifts that you have give, given us as a reminder that you continue to sustain everything you have made. And Lord, although, although sin has infected everything in this world and everything continues to rot and decay, you continue to bring life into the world. Lord, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to be our sacrifice on the cross, the blood that was shed for our sin. We thank you for forgiving us out of your mercy and grace. And Lord, we thank you for resurrecting your son from the dead and defeating death so that we no longer need to fear it. And Lord, we ask that this would be our confidence and our hope going forward in the days ahead, that although we may die, that we will live forever. We'll give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Almighty God, we lift up to you all of those who are, are bearing those some of those aches and pains that have come into this world. We lift up to you. Gail Gage, who was recovering from hip replacement surgery, we ask that you would heal her, and that in the days ahead, she would continue to make progress and make a full recovery. We lift up Kevin Summer, who was recovering from a broken foot, and that you would continue to help him to heal through the care of nurses and doctors who, who treat and who care for him. And Father, we lift up to you Louise Langless, home from the hospital, falling breathing problems and having to remove some fluid from her lungs. We thank you for the doctors and nurses who treated her, cared for her, and got her home. And Lord, we lift up Mike Botts, who is a good friend of jo jo Joanna and Tom Anderson, who's hospitalized with pneumonia. Please be with Mike. Care for him and let your healing hand be over him as he finds comfort in the care he receives 
and comfort in the word proclaims to him and bring him to good health. Lord, we pray for all of these, our brothers and sisters, your children, and those who are in our hearts and our minds now. We'll give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Finally, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for those who are called to minister to children and the young people in our congregation, especially those who stepped up over the past several months as we reopened our Sunday school ministry amidst this pandemic and the challenges it brings. We pray your blessing upon Tracy Beardsley, our Sunday school superintendent, and each teacher as we anticipate a full staff and classrooms again this coming fall. Equip each one with a desire to study your word for themselves so that they too may grow in grace and increase in their knowledge and love of the Lord Jesus, inspiring the children in their charge to mature in their faith and be strengthened to stand firm in your word within a culture that seems to have forgotten who created them. We'll give thanks unto the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As we prepare to come before this table where Christ invites us to receive his body and blood for the forgiveness of sins, uh, just a few notes of procedure. Uh, we are going to be having you go around the outside using the ramp and the sidewalk by the flag to come around and receive the bread and wine, kind of coming in and then turning around and going back out and making your way to your seat. Uh, there is hand sanitizer on each cart if that is something you would like, as well as those offering boxes for your convenience to come up as well. We now come before this table, this banquet feast that Christ has prepared for us. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also, after supper, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Thank you. Please share that peace of God with those around you.
Now may this true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and keep you all in both body and in soul until life everlasting. Depart now in his peace. Amen. Please stand and receive now the benediction of our Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. We sing.